Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, a yet another Metatopia panel. Uh, this one is called How to Make and Sell RPG Adventures. Uh, and uh, we have a fabulous collection of guests here tonight. I'm going to start uh, with uh, my friend Alex uh, to uh, be the first person to introduce herself. Okay, I'm Alex. I'm from Britain, but I live in Germany. Um, I've been designing uh, RPG adventures since the late 90s, and I've written a phenomenally large number of them. <laughs> um, over time, I've kind of developed my own unique style of adventure that puts a huge amount of emphasis on character interaction, inter-party dynamics, uh, secrets, and reveals, and that's been rather successful. So that's me. Okay. Uh, Christopher, do you want to uh, hit one here? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, in my day job, I'm Professor Christopher McLaughlin, but I have a secret identity as Christopher McLaughlin, uh, head of uh, Ghost Show Press, uh, the creative pit boss. And uh, you might recognize me if you're really, really old school. If you remember my start 22 years ago, you may remember some of the adventures that I put out for various iterations of Deadlands and various Deadland settings. Uh, but uh, my great claim to fame is uh, the work that I did during my time with Green Renin Publishing. Uh, we did uh, Time of Crisis and got a pen and paper award. We did Time of Vengeance, got an innie. Uh, we did Emerald City Knights, got another innie. And uh, I, I'm blessed to be in the, in the core rule book as the author of Time of the Apes. So if you <laughs> most most people who start out playing M&M at least at least at least thumb through one of my adventures which is a right. tremendous thrill and honor. Fabulous. All right, Lynn, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Lynn Hardy. I'm the associate editor for Call of Cthulhu at Chaosium and the line editor for the upcoming Rivers of London role-playing game. Um I've been writing and designing my own adventures since the um, early 90s now. Uh, and for the last eight years, I've been full-time freelance, writing, editing, developing, you name it, um, chief cook and bottle washer on a couple of occasions um, for <laughs> various different companies here, there and everywhere. Great. Thank you. Uh, Graham. So hi, I'm Graham Wormsley. Um, I'm probably best known for the uh, the Cthulhu-ish stuff I've done. So I've, I've written my own system, which is Cthulhu Dark, and I've written a lot of games for Trail of Cthulhu. Um, but I've also written various uh, adventures for various companies. So I've you know the Doctor Who role playing game, uh, the Laundry RPG, and things like that. Great. Uh, and I'm Darren Watts. Uh, once upon a time, I was the president and owner of Hero Games when we published Champions. Uh, I was also the president and owner of Indie Press Revolution. Uh, it's starting in about uh, 2011. I got out of the owning things business and went freelance full time. And since then, I have worked for also Doctor Who Adventures, uh, Star Trek. Uh, and I am currently working uh, primarily with Greater Than Games on the uh, Sentinels Comics RPG. So. So the the question at hand uh, is uh, basically the 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 you know within the game design uh, you know umbrella that we've been talking about uh, uh, technique and that sort of thing for the entire show. For this, we want to specifically talk about uh, adventures and scenarios. Um, whether you know the the material of uh, creating adventures and scenarios that show off a game uh, <laughs> to its best uh, in its best light, that uh, entertain a wide range of players for it, and ideally um, actually are uh, viable as products, uh, you know, that will actually sell uh, to be worth their time. There is a bit of a truism in the industry that it is extremely difficult frequently to sell uh, RPG adventures uh, as a product unto themselves. And I guess we're, one of the things we'll uh, talk about here is how, how fair and how true a statement that is. Um, so why don't we start with the, you know, go back to the top here with Alex and say, you know, like, so what is, uh, what what's difficult? What's interesting? What's uh, significant specifically about RPG adventures as a product, as a uh, as something in the marketplace? Um, I think it has to be. Uh, oh gosh, it has to be. Um, it's got to stick out of the market. You can't just publish a generic dungeon crawl, it's, unless you're D and D. 
<laughs> right, um, <yeah. laughs> you need something that is a bit different to everything else that's going to get attention that's maybe only going to appeal to a subset of the market because you're not going to please everybody um, and it needs to be fairly self-contained um, and I take the view that um, I think the most certainly the most successful adventures I've written are ones where the players feel like they're really achieving something over the course of what's actually a short period of time rather than a campaign. Um, okay. So you're putting a lot of stuff happening into quite a short period of time. <laughs> um, and you want to make the most of that, build up to a really good climax. And yeah, if you get all the pieces right, then it's a perfectly sellable product. Okay, great. Uh, uh, Chris, same, basically same question. Is this a, you know, it, it, is, is it a viable uh, means of, uh, you know, like creating a, a line? Uh, and if so, uh, what can you do to stand out in the marketplace with your, with your book of adventures? Well, uh, the greatest uh, window I got on this particular situation was I, I've always said I had the best interest, inter, entry into the, into RPG world ever. The guy who owned my comics and game store started his own game company, uh, and that happened to be sure. Shane Hensley in Deadlands. And I got to see Deadlands going from being some photocopies on his kitchen table to one of the, I think, key cornerstone RPG systems. And I learned so much from Shane about what adventures can do for you. And... Um, uh, and now that I have my own imprint, I'm learning the value of graphic design and art. And, you know, you can't put too high a price on good art that sells your idea. But uh, without getting into a, a, a side of the street, I don't usually work, but allowing that art is important. Th mm -hmm. I think the main thing I learned from Shane was the just the value of good writing. He said that the problem with most adventures is they're, 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 they're all plot and nobody sees them as writing it's it, it, especially when we started back in 95 96 it was it was always you go here and there's an orc you go there and there's a box of treasure shane always told me that you know if you make the adventures fun to read not only are you going to build an audience especially uh, among people who may never have any intention of running them at all they just they just think it's an enjoyable read uh, you, you all, you also, you sell some sizzle along with the steak. You know, you, you can convey that this is much more than the j dungeon crawl by looking at more as telling a story rather than telling what happens when the players round this corner, what's in, what's in the next, you know, 30 by 30 room. So I've always, I've always tried to write very, very conversationally, very entertainingly. I like digressions. I like jokes. It's kind of my thing. And uh, <laughs> it, it, se it, seems, it, seems to, it seems to have served me well. I did, I did get one bad review from a guy said that my writing is too friendly. I wanted to send him a reply back say, saying, F you. Do you like the book better now? So, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, but, uh, but yeah. But yeah, but yeah, okay. but just, I mean, write, writing adventures to be read, I think, I think is something that, that's, uh, that's been a valuable lesson to me the whole 22 years. And God bless you, Shane Hensley, for giving me that chestnut. Sure. Is there a way that you can signify with, uh, with art, for example, with a cover, like you, you were saying, that this is a friendly piece? I mean, like, how does a, how does a player know that when they are, uh, or a potential purchaser of this book know that when they're kind of, you know, like scanning through their shelves at their store? Well, you know that's that's where that's where good art can make all the difference. Uh, you know okay. uh, that that that, mag that magnificent cover of Time of Crisis. We we wanted to take people on us on a fun Silver Age comic ride, and I think that that cover totally, totally, totally sells it. And and if I had to pick among amongst my children, I think Time of Vengeance does an even greater job. I mean that incredibly gothy and dark. Um, I've never quite gotten over the the Val Kilmery, a um, uh, uh, Will Ferrell looking guy down in the corner. But but if you can put him aside, <laughs> you know, I mean that that that's that sell. I mean it it, it it it's it's so 2007 in so many ways. But yeah, but it sells its gothiness and its darkness. Okay, and, and it and its fundamental high stakeness. So so yeah, I, yeah yeah. I think art can definitely do that. And the interior art by Talon Dunning. Mwah, oh, sure. Oh, okay. Yes. Speaking of darkness, let's ask uh, Lynn about specifically. I mean, if you're selling uh, selling for Cthulhu, I mean, like, how do you uh, how do you stand out in the marketplace when you're competing with as many different uh, versions of your kind of you know core concept as as exist in the marketplace right now? What 
Thankfully for, for us, um, our fans have an insatiable appetite in terms of consuming what we put out. And it is Fabulous. interesting because, I mean, core rule books always sell better than supplements, always across the board. But certainly with Call of Cthulhu, the scenario supplements sell really well as well. I think partly because a lot of people are very nervous about writing their own mysteries. They think that writing mysteries are hard. Um, so that's certainly something I've heard from various people over the years. So, you know, they're, they're keen to get hold of mysteries. Um, they don't have to figure them out for themselves. I mean, what Chris was saying is correct. You know, if you write them, write them entertainingly so that they're enjoyable to read is good. Uh, but it's also taking on board what Alex said. It is making sure that people, that players have agency within that story. You're not presenting a short story that they're there watching. And if you right. can deliver deliver something that is entertaining for the keeper or the gm or whatever the system storyteller lead is called um you know make it entertaining for them to run make it entertaining for the players to play and they have plenty of space to put their own imprint on it to develop the story where they want it to go um tracking art is always good um that will help sell it um, but at the end of the day, you need to have that firm foundation of a plot that doesn't have any gigantic leaps of logic, that there <laughs> are multiple ways for people to get from the start to the finish. So if they do decide, bless their little hearts, to go wandering <laughs> off on a detour, they're still going to get everything they need to get to the, the, the finale. Um, then, you know, that's you will have something sellable. Everybody's got their own style. Everybody's got their own taste. Thankfully, um, when you have a lot of people writing things, you will usually be able to find something that will appeal to your group's tastes or your players' tastes, your tastes. Um, right. But we have to accept the fact that, as Alex said, not everything that you do is going to appeal to everybody. Um, some people will love your stuff. Some people will not like your stuff. And it's finding your niche and finding your audience, which can be really hard, actually particularly in these days where, you know, it's easier to get an adventure out and sell it now because we've got various online platforms where you can self-publish. But getting the, the signal heard over the noise now is actually more of the problem than getting the thing published in the first place. Right. Well, you, you've hit two or three things that I uh, yeah, I, I wanted to uh, bring up over the course of this. So, um, but I do, you, you hit one that I hadn't thought of that I'm kind of like fascinated by. So I'm going to come back to you quick with um, the idea that uh, that the the appeal, part of the appeal is not having to write a mystery. Do you think as a, as a genre um, that like mystery adventures or um, uh, uh, games that where mysteries are kind of like part of the core activity, it's what is what's going on have that that adventures in that case have more appeal than they might in another genre um precisely because as you say there is a there's a, a tendency for uh for gms for players to think that that's a particularly hard one for them to come up on their own yeah and i think it's one of the reasons why our supplements and such scenarios do sell is because people do have this real wariness of writing their own in case they get it wrong um, sure. you know it's 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 okay. You don't have to be Agatha Christie or Conan Doyle to write a mystery. You know, Agatha Christie, bless her, I love her, but she only had seven <laughs> plots. You, you can reuse these things mm -hmm. and just swap things out. You know, sure. If you find a, a Conan Doyle or, a, or an Agatha Christie or any mystery that you like, you know, it's okay to pay homage to it and file the serial numbers off. And I'm giving away secrets here, but, <laughs> you know, learn from the best, borrow, pay, fealty <laughs> to, to the best, um, you know, and just don't be afraid to try. I didn't say that honest. Please buy our books. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start on something real quickly. You know, we're also sure. living in a, we're also living in a, cult, a cultural age that I think even before COVID, we're we're in an age where uh, entertainment more uh, is comfort food. There's some people are sure. looking for familiarity. You know, people are, people are looking to have oh, their expectations okay. met. Right. You know, uh, you know, I'm, you know, we should feel less shame than ever if if we borrow a bit here and a bit there. I think more than ever, that's kind of what our audience might be looking for. Sure, absolutely. It. I, I was just. I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm kind. Of of interested in the idea that it's actually genre related and i say this as somebody who literally just a few weeks ago in my home star trek game wrote a locked transporter room mystery so it's a you know 
uh, kind of kind of an interesting idea for me that there's a that there's a difference in genres. So I'm going to come over to to Graham with the, the you know a similar question for us. Are there genres for which it is easier? or more interesting or more successful uh, to write adventures for than, than for others? Like what are, the, what are the good ones and what are the bad ones for having that sort of thing? Wow. Um, and are the genres for which it's more successful? I mean, yeah, Cthulhu is right, one of them, yeah. absolutely. I mean, you know, people, I, I think there is something about giving people um, a little bit of what they want. Um, I, I was going to, I mean, I, I think one thing Liz, uh, Lynn said, which is really important, was this idea of um, making sure that your adventure isn't like telling a story. Because like the worst kind of adventure is basically kind of, here is the backstory, which I have made up in my head. Go and find it out. And and, and it's just right, really, right. it's quite dull. And the real challenge in adventures is to actually create this sandbox for people to play through. You know, so yeah, there is a backstory and there is this kind of framework to make people feel feel they're not kind of flailing completely in the dark but ultimately i mean the game is about uh, is about players choices and it's about letting them have fun and so you're creating this little box for them to to have fun is and i think that's the challenge is there a kind of an adventure? Is there a kind of like adventure that you can write that in fact isn't mystery? I mean, like most everything that we pre wind up presenting to heroes, to players, no matter what genre we're in, is kind of like asking them to, you know, uncover a problem and solve it, uh, you know, on some level. To, depending on it, I guess, on the, the, once again, on the genre of the games, but most of what we're talking about are games that are inherently conservative, right? That are, that are inherently small c conservative, meaning that there's a status quo that we like, and part of the uh, purpose of the game, of the adventure, is to restore it, right? Something has gone wrong, and we're trying to fix it, as opposed to adventures oh God, that present I players... Sorry, you've you've obviously never played one of my adventures, Darren. Um, I probably haven't. No. <laughs> um, so, well, then tell me about it. I mean, like, it, 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 that seems like a very kind of like simple way to go about running an adventure. And if if there's a, a more interesting way to do it, then I think you should describe it for our for our so, audience here. I, I guess two things there. I mean, um, I, the, the reason I picked up on that is because I, you know, I, I love Cthulhu adventures where actually you discover that everything is wrong and you can't put it right. So uh, that's my, you know, that, that's <laughs> okay, my kind of favorite, right. and that that tends to be what I write. Um, yeah, um, I I think there's something about. Uh, do you know, Darren? I don't, the thought had gone out of my head. I can't quite remember what it was now. Um, I think I, I think there's something interesting about mysteries and in that you don't just want the thing to be here is a piece of the mystery here is the piece of the mystery here's the piece of the mystery and i think one way to get around that is to is to have the the mystery affect the players so sure. you want to be writing i mean especially for horror you want to be writing a, here is a piece of the mystery now let's take a moment and talk about how that that affects you here's another piece right. of the mystery this is going to blow your character's lives out of the water what are you going to do now <laughs> right Okay, well, th that's a fabulous, I think, uh, uh, you know, topic to bring in for this, which is how do you as a writer of adventures, a writer of scenarios and that sort of thing, make sure that you leave the space in? How do you uh, uh, support the, the, the game master, whoever's running the game, in personalizing the adventure to their table, to their players, you know, like how do you put in those kind of like, you know, links that can be, that can be made uh, to you know a, a table full of players that you don't know who they are you know uh alex do you have a something on that or um yeah so the sort of adventures i tend to write these days um are the sort which are very very self-contained um tend to be independent of any system um okay. and um i tend to write them with characters that are tailored and are part of the story of the adventure. So I don't tend to so much these days write adventures which can um, be played by any set of characters. Instead, I like to consider it as a whole self-contained experience. And, uh, okay. the, and I will design uh, characters that go with the adventure and can be picked up by players. Um, they put their own spin on it, obviously. Uh, um, but so you're designing they, one shots basically for them, or, or you know, multi. But I mean, yeah. it's a they may take multiple sessions, but it is still yes, right. Uh, 
And um, oh, I've lost my track now. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so, what you were so, saying? Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, so, the way I design these is that this isn't any bunch of characters, and it's not any story. The characters within the scenario are integral to the story. To the story itself. And the story right. is integral to the characters. They are part of a whole rather than one thing tacked on to another. Got it. Um, and so this makes it a very, very self-contained experience that it comes up to a grand finale where the players really feel they've, through their characters, they are invested in the world around them and the choices they make are going to have a massive impact uh, on the world around them. Right. Um, basically, yeah, making it a um, very, very intense experience. That's what I go for. <laughs> now, when you, when you create those characters, when you're designing the characters to go with the story for this, uh, do you include in that character creation process links that the players can kind of like attach to to personalize them themselves or oh, yes. to... right um so. what i do is i will write for the characters the only stuff that i'll generally define other than the very basic who are you and where do you come from um is the stuff that's relevant to the scenario and right. that is going to come up during the course of the game um so if they've got you know a secret that they murdered someone then i'll state that on the, the <laughs> right. because that is going to come up in the game as part of the game experience. Um, everything else I leave for the player to fill in by themselves okay. to kind right. of make it out to who they want it to be. Right. Um, and this does tend to mean that, I mean, I've run some of these games like 10, 20 times, and it does tend to be completely different every single time. Um, sure. Because the players put completely different spin on the characters, um, and yeah, it seems to work. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I'm sure it does. Absolutely. Um, do we do I, for for everybody else here for this, when you are writing adventures? Do you tend to do it the way that Alex does? Are you writing uh, with a specific set of pre-generated characters? Uh, to present to the players, or do you write your adventures more with the idea that somebody's home campaign is going to use this adventure, or do you do both? And then, if you do both, what's the difference between them? So, any of you guys who have a have an answer to that or interest in that? Can, can, does anyone mind if I jump in? Please do. Different. Um. So I kind of do. It I do both, but it kind of depends on what the scenario is for. If it's a mm -hmm. one-shot convention scenario. Then I'll do exactly what Alex does. I will design pre-gens that will go with that scenario that have an invested interest in being involved in that scenario, can be easily hooked into it. Um, I, I like to, to do for my convention scenarios. I tend to write a new one every year and run it with every convention that I go to that year. Um, and it's always interesting to see, as Alex said, the spin that different players will put on those exact same characters. You give them the framework, you give them the key information that they that ties them to that scenario, and then you watch them run with it um, and see what they do, which is, you know, it's always highly entertaining to see what people do with the things that you've written. <laughs> oh, sure, absolutely. Um, it's great. I love it. Um, so with one shots, yeah, uh, for conventions particularly, because you don't have a lot of time, you don't want to be spending that time getting people to roll up characters and things. Mm -hmm to get to get going um mm. you know that i think pre-gens are wonderful things mm. when you when i'm writing big campaigns because we tend to always make sure we include a set of pre-gens yes they're in the back of my mind but then i will also make sure that i'm giving advice i, I will basically have somewhere somewhere at the beginning saying you know we've included these pre-gens you might want to have a look at them to act as inspiration for the mm -hmm. sorts of characters that would get involved or you know these are the key skills that are going to be really helpful if you're creating bespoke investigators to go look at this um you know look at your characters backstories 
look at the things that the players have chosen that are important to their characters and how can you then use those to draw them in to this plot because I mean that at the end of the day is one of the trickiest things about writing scenarios for sale is that you have absolutely no idea right. who's going to be playing them at the end of the day <laughs> right if you're writing for your group you can tailor it to mess with their minds as much as possible uh, uh, right because you know them you've gained with them you know which buttons to push <laughs> If you're writing for a market that you've never, largely never met, that's a lot harder to do. So you have to give the the GM, the keeper, the tools to sort of look at the characters their players have got, look at what they're interested in through those characters, and then find ways to tie those into the plot outline that you've given to them. Right. Do you ever go so far as to, or, or be so explicit as to say something like it would be a really good idea if uh, you can convince one of your players that you know they should be related to fred to the npc over here or something right do you go <laughs> like that sometimes, that level yeah. of like detail or do you just yeah okay sometimes yeah i mean that can be one of the suggestions i mean quite often we will have a you know these are suggested occupations these are good skills to have you know it would be really handy if one or more of the investigators either know each other or are related to fred or you know, hate Fred's gut. <laughs> he is um, a dirty, dirty scoundrel. Yeah, you know. yeah. <laughs> hmm. So, so I, I totally do that. Um, right. I so, so the thing that Alex is. By the way, Alex's adventures are fantastic. I've played them. Um, the thing that Alex is talking about that you you have these pre-generated characters and you're sort of keying your scenario into. Um, into the specific characters. Um, you can do that a little bit uh, just in that kind of way. Um, so, right. you know, you can say you can create your own characters, but make sure they've got some sort of, you know, massive drive to achieve something. Make sure they've got this relationship to this one person and things like that. And I, I mean, to be honest, I overuse it. Um, but but I do do that quite a lot. Um, you know, um, make sure they've got some uh, a, some injury or something that they're healing from, and then later on in the um, in the adventure, you know, you, you know, you're you're reincorporating that that later. Mm -hmm. But I, I sort of think that's one of the, the keys to making it interesting is to uh, is to find ways of sort of hooking characters in rather than just kind of going, oh, here's an adventure. You know, it it's scary or it's fun um, to actually kind of find ways to whoever the characters are give the the dm the gm just ways to to draw those specific characters into it <laughs> um and it, i would imagine it certainly helps it depends on the system that you're writing for right i mean a, a system like uh, like trail where where drives are really explicit uh in the character creation process i would think would kind of uh help you kind of connect that right that you can say uh you know any player with the drive x should feel or should be you know we should point this out to them to try to uh, uh see if, if that connects to the way that they're using their drive as a player yeah, I think that's that's really interesting. I mean, you can you can do it without, right? I mean, you you can do it just by saying, you know, make sure your character has a you know has a family relationship to whoever. Um, I think what you just said is really interesting because I think one of the interesting things about scenarios is that in a way they kind of like I think of it them as like flattering the system. Um, so they you know they they're they're written around a particular system. Um. One sure. of the things I've always tried to do is kind of pull out the interesting bits of the the system and kind of go, okay, well, here's a scenario for Trail of Cthulhu. Um, you know, this this had this has this interesting thing which is, um, I, you know, drives or whatever. I'm going to do a scenario which is just going to just going to use that. I think that's we'll a, feature that's a nice that aspect of the game is what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, all three of you have talked about do, uh, doing, um, you know, your, your self-contained, you know, with a, uh, with, with a piece, um, do any of you, I know, uh, Chris and I have both, for example, written superhero scenarios where we expect that the game is going to be played as part of a long-term campaign, right? And we don't have the, or, or, you know, that our audience is not necessarily looking for one shots, Right, that's or, or we may provide them in a different circumstance, but we're looking to provide fodder and material for you know somebody's weekly or bi-weekly game, uh, you know that they can do. What's the Chris? What's the difference in that sort of thing when we're actually trying to do something uh, that will fit into uh, what a GM and players are already doing at home? Well, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, when you're when you're writing something like uh, back when I was with Ronin, writing for Mutants and Masterminds, writing for their various settings. 
you know, right. you're sort of obligated to put all the toys back on the shelf and, you know, not, not break too much of the furniture there. But, right. uh, but, you know, I, I find that even when you're writing for a light for a licensed property that, that um, people are going to take it and make it their own regardless. You know, right. I, okay. I don't, I don't, I don't know that that matters quite as much as that you have an interesting situation and a good villain. Like, um, I, 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 I have a coll mental collection of like my favorite remixes of Time of Vengeance. But Time of Vengeance was written explicitly to introduce people to the Freedom City setting, make them a part of it. And uh, I it, it's based on it's based on things that happened in World War II. I, I got a great email from somebody who was running a World War II campaign and just reset all the backstory and tragedy to World War One. I got somebody in their, home game, yeah, yeah, right. in their home game. I got somebody else that just moved the whole thing to Israel and did it with like the different language, different culture, different political situation, but kept, but kept so much of the fundamental story. Right. So yeah, I, I just think, I think you have to go in knowing you're going to be, you're, you're going to be remixed. I mean, you can, you, you, to an extent you have to play to a setting or a licensed property. If you, if you're dealing with something like that, but I, I just, I, I think as long as you're giving them that solid villain and that solid story, everything else takes care of itself. Go on, Alex. Please. Uh, when I'm writing, I tend not to rely on external villains. Um, I'm again, I'm making mine all about the characters, and they tend they tend to become each other's own villains. <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely but and I, I think some of that is going to be connected to what genre you're writing for right i mean it's uh the, a, a group of uh hero superheroes at the table uh you know the revelation that one of them is actually evil or whatever is you know is like a big <laughs> campaign event whereas in a horror campaign yeah. it's pretty much oh that's just tuesday right like one of us <laughs> turned out to be evil. you know that's so uh I don't think that's a, like I said, I think that may, may just simply depend on the kind of genre you were saying. Uh, Lynn, you had yeah. something you wanted to get in there. I mean, sometimes it's interesting what, what Chris was saying, though. Sometimes with published material, you do have to give less confident GMs and keepers permission to alter things to fit their group. Um, right. Because they're, cause they're not, they've not got the confidence. They think that they have to run it exactly as written. It's like, no, if, if it's going to work a if it's going to, you know, if it's going to be better for your group to tweak something, leave this bit out, alter it slightly, change things around a little bit, then, you know, do it. Because, again, you know, we've written things not knowing who's going to pick this up and play this, not knowing what the, who the characters are necessarily going to be. Um, so, you know, we we don't mind if you change things. We don't put little cameras in the books to watch you to make sure that you're running it exactly as it's written. Come take away your books from you if you do that it. You know of. Oh, come and they know your of. hands that, we, that you know of. Right. Um, you know, but sometimes people are a bit nervous about doing that because they think, oh, we've bought this. We'll have to run it exactly the way it is. And it's like, no, you know, change it to make sure that it works for your group. Sure. Because at the end of the day, the idea is that people have fun telling this story together and slavishly following something that isn't working for you and your group is not fun. Of course. That, that once again, being said, making those changes, doing that kind of adaptation is a skill, and it's a skill that you need to develop. It's a, you, you don't necessarily know that the first day that you sit down to be a GM, right? So no. let's quickly talk or, or kind of like bring in the discussion of the difference between writing uh introductory adventures right like the 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 sample adventure that goes in your rule book right of like demonstrating how this game is played how that's different from writing a scenario for a book where you're expecting the players already kind of like know the system and the genre and you know uh, know what's going on how do you best show off both rules and genre in a in an introductory adventure Not everybody at once. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I'm waiting. I, play, uh, uh, the first thing I might play to the tropes. You know, if you're sure. writing for okay. if you're writing for superheroes, put them in a position where they have where you know a bus has fallen on top of a puppy, and only you can save the adorable puppy, and show them that in this game, yes, you can lift the bus off the puppy yourself. You know, and the puppy will somehow amazingly be fine. Apparently, yeah. Un unless you're running, a, unless you're running a, a, a '90s campaign, sure, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> sure. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you know, uh, that is a good point, though. Like that, when when you're kind of like changing, when your genre is different from the way the real world works, you do have to kind of like demonstrate that right away uh, to make sure that everybody's kind of like bought into uh, the, you know how the universe actually works, right? And and how problems are going to be resolved. Yeah. Right, like if it's yeah. a superhero adventure, then you know people mostly work out their problems by punching each other. Yeah, uh, I mean, I so, mean, I, yeah. After after fifteen years of running various mutants and masterminds demos, like the phrase I hear over and over again, "You mean I can do that?" Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you get it across them. Sure, you 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 can you can you can do a triple somersault while you're reading Poe and then kick somebody in the face. It's right. superheroes, and here's how you do it in our game. It's just one die roll. Right. Okay? Yeah. But you don't want to cross them up in the sample adventure, right? Like in a in a in a later adventure, you may actually uh, be presenting the heroes with a with a situation that's a twist on the on their expectations, right? Where it says, yeah. uh, you know, in this game, it's actually a much better idea to talk mm. to the bad guy than just fly in and punch him, right? Oh yeah. Or it's a much oh, yeah. better idea to do something else. But really, in that first game, you probably shouldn't, right? In the first game, you should play yeah. to the expected tropes, to the to the cliches, to show them how your system handles the cliches, the things that will come that will come up most frequently, right? And like show off how that is actually going to work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by the time you're writing those later adventures, you want to give them the uh, you want to give them as many ways to wrap. You want to give them possible. the twists, right? Yeah. Exactly. You know, I you know, I mean, I wrapped up Time of Vengeance with well, you can either fist fight my power level 14 villain, or you could actually literally talk your way to victory with a, right. with, with a good enough negotiation role. You could end this with by talking to her. Yeah, right. that's what you have to do on your on your second, your third, your fourth adventure. Sure. It's uh, interesting because so, I, so. I don't like. I mean, to be honest, I, I don't think I. I think in terms of of introductory adventures and, and more complex ones, which isn't saying it's you know. I, I, I'm sure that sort of works with other things, but I mean, I'm I'm really interested in what in what Lynn said about this idea of sort of giving people permission to be creative, because I think sure. that's that's incredibly important because, um, yeah, a lot of time people kind of pick up the adventure and go, "Oh, I'm going to run this," and sometimes all you have to do is is kind of say say to people ask each one of your players to you know make up a relationship to something or ask one uh, ask each one of your players to say how their characters are related to each other and then suddenly they're like, oh right well i can i can actually make stuff up and, right. and similarly i mean when you when you're writing the adventure yourself you can, you can say things like um you know uh, use this scene whenever you think things are getting a little quiet and at that point they're like oh right so I, I don't actually have to like follow it step by step i can actually you know i can use it and so you're almost like giving people training wheels um to <laughs> like do and, and that's not meant to be patronizing at all but just giving them little tools so they can kind of go okay now now i can i can do all this and this is fine i think I on that kind of note uh one thing i absolutely hate in a lot of published adventures is box text you know, where the GM just sits and reads out the kind of description of sure, the area right. and whatnot. Um, I think it's, it's, it's much better just to kind of give the GM a few tips and about, well, it's a bar, tell them what's really important because it matters to the story, but then tell them, go ahead and describe it how you want. Um, it brings in a lot more creativity. Um, it's not someone just droning out text. And uh, yeah, it gives the GM and the players a lot more space to expand and make it their own. <laughs> yes, I, I certainly agree that that's, that that's a goal. I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, I mean, would you say that that's the way that you learned? For it, I mean, like, what was what was your first RPG like, and uh, you know, how did you develop the skill of being able to to do that bar scene and make it, uh, you know, like plausible and interesting for the players? Uh, I never read the box text. I <laughs> okay, it, and then I described it myself. <laughs> um, okay, and I would add in, you know, ex extra characters or extra details that I thought would add flavor that this particular group would pick up on um i'd add npcs um but yeah i would use the I, box i'm curious how old were you when you first when you first did this how old were you when you first gm'd um about 19 okay um, i started role playing when i went to university when i was 18 so sure okay it was around that time um and yeah, so I 
took the box text as kind of inspiration for uh, describing it myself because just seeing and reading it didn't feel natural at all. I, I may be showing off my age in, in uh, you know, uh, uh, questioning that even for it because I, I you know, uh, when I first started doing um, GMing, when I first started playing, I mean, I, I GMed my first game when I was 11 years old. Um, and if that Whoa. box text hadn't been there, there's no way I'd have made it through, right? Like, it's, you know, okay. it's at some point I needed to actually, like, you know, like, learn the process. Yes, what you describe is precisely how I would do it myself today. But today I've got 40 years of experience running games, mm. right? It's at the time that I was doing it, I really needed that box desk to show me how it was done. I didn't have kind of like an, an, an innate understanding of how to present fiction to my players, right? So I'm, I, I'm curious if it's a... Uh, uh, I guess then you're looking at, well, are you designing an adventure for someone who's never GM before and possibly players who've right, never well, played before, which I think is, you know, you need to consider very different things to right. if you're designing it for... Certainly, and I think you probably know that when you sit down to do the product, right? Like, is this yeah. something that we're aiming at people who have never played before at all, or yeah. are we aiming this at somebody who is expected to have some experience? You know, is is this game aimed at somebody to be their first game or not? Right? It's a. Uh, and I think know. it's okay to, like I said at the beginning, I think it's okay to define the niche you're going for. Um, sure. I don't mm -hmm. think every adventure has to be runnable by new VGMs and. Uh, but then, you know, there's uh, there's also a philosophical thing at stake. I mean, if you're writing something that's, that's an explicitly introductory adventure, are you also telling part of your part, your, your market of more experienced players they don't need to buy this product? And by right. the same token, if that's yeah, a question. I, I mean, it, it, I, not to dip too far into my day job, but, you know, uh, they don't let me do two lectures for the advanced, one for the advanced learners and one for the slower learners. I have to come right. up with one presentation they're both going to get, they're going to get to. And, right. you know, maybe, maybe including the box text for the people who need it, but, you know, maybe emphasizing that, you know, make it your own. You're not obligated. You're not obligated to read this the way that it is. Maybe hits a happy medium. I don't know. You know, yeah, I, get, running games was the best preparation I ever had for being an educator. And, and sure. the, the part, of, part of that is you only get one shot at it. <laughs> and this is why the power of the sentence read or paraphrase the following because then right. you're giving it absolutely you know, sure people who aren't confident you are giving them permission to read it for people who are confident you're saying do it your way right. make it sound like it's something that you would come up with um and that is very handy certainly with with the call of cthulhu starter set the way mike set it up was that we started with paper chase which was a one-on-one -on -one, um, just to give the, the, the keeper a chance to develop skills with only one investigator to have to worry about. Um, and there was lots of support and advice. It's like, oh, you know, you might want to roll now or you might want to think about this or this would be a good opportunity to do this. And then, and of course, the next adventure in the box set is, you know, it's with a couple of players um, and there's a little bit less advice. Um, we're kind of hoping that you're starting to pick up on things now. There's more sort of encouraging you to put your own spin on things. Uh, and then by the time you get to Dead Man's Stomp, there's a lot less little keeper notes right. advising you where you might want to be, how you might want to be handling things and pointing pointing people in certain directions. Uh, and of course, you've got more players. So you've got more, you know, you're juggling more balls, trying to keep those in the air. Uh, and it was, we, you know, Mike's idea was that you did it step by step. You know, you had, you went, you increased the complexity of the plot while withdrawing the level of support and advice. Right. Take your hands you off, the, uh, off the bicycle and yeah. let them go. Right. Yeah, so yeah. As, as Graham said, training wheels, and not in a derogatory term, because it is a skill. You know, learning how to, to manage a game and support players telling a story is a real skill. And, you know, it, it can be a hairy experience. And if you've got that extra bit of support in there for people who aren't used to it, and I mean, you could include that, but still make it entertaining for experienced players who sure. might just fancy something mm. a little bit less complicated because, mm. you know, they kind of fancy a break from the mega world spanning <laughs> campaign they've been playing for the last 80 years. <laughs> yeah. um, and just fancy going off and doing something quite simple and entertaining for two to three hours. Especially if it brings them more people to play with, right? Like if, it's, yeah. if, if you're the experienced person at the table and you're introducing, you know, the game or gaming in general to a group of younger players or something for the first time first time you know 
making making that choice, picking picking which to do that with, I think is kind of like a key uh, a key idea. Darren, I'm just thinking we we've um, we've done a lot on like how to make RPG adventures, which we could probably talk for mm-hmm. about for ages. Do we want to kind of go more towards the like the product side of things and how to how to sell them? Absolutely, I mean, I'm still working it out. Absolutely, but, you know. that's sure. Absolutely, uh, yeah, we're 45 minutes in. That we spend the next 10 or 15. I guess let's talk about uh, actually how we actually sell these. Uh, have you got a, a something to something to start us with on it or? Uh... Shall I try try starting? Um, so I mean, I think what's I, I mean, I, I'm I'm in a very different space from uh, you know from from Lynn and and probably from from Chris and and probably from you, Darren. I mean, I've um I'd, I've sort of sort of um flitted very much between writing for third party companies and publishing my own stuff, um, and that's that's really worked for me. So you know, I I will um I will go off and write something for uh, for Pelgrane or for you know for Doctor Who game or something like that. Um, and especially for the Trail of Cthulhu stuff, you, you sort of, that sort of gets your name known a bit, and then sure. you kind of bring people back to your own stuff. But then, of course, once you've published your own stuff, you can go to a company and go, well, actually, I've done this stuff before. So, mm-hmm. you know, can I? And, and so I just, you know, if someone was interested in publishing their own stuff, I'd, I'd really advise them to, you know, to, to kind of do both and to try lots of things uh, because you, you, you learn lots of things and you, um, yeah. You, you, you can, you can take build your brand personally so that people recognize your name, mm, that yes. know where they've seen you before, can follow you. We actually, there was an entire panel just a couple of hours ago that we were talking about how, how to actually build your brand uh, as, as a designer, how to get your name uh, uh, out there for it. I think that absolutely is, is key for the, to, to the process. Um, well, yeah. Let's uh, t- toss that all, all, out to everybody else as well for this. How do you, uh, you know, how how do you build an audience uh, for your for for your RPGs for your that that will be interested in buying your adventures? Uh, well, I think that's a fabulous bit of advice. You know, if you're freelancing for a good company, I mean, I was so blessed to see Shane Hensley build Deadlands from the ground up, and you know, uh, for absolutely no extra charge, I got to hear designers like Chris Prima. And and Rob Schwalb and Steve Kinson trade notes back and forth, and I just got to sit there with my notepad and 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 when it came time to launch Ghost Show, uh, it, it, Ghost Show almost launched by accident, but it turns out that I I had. I had built up a brand accidentally just by working for good companies who who were keen on letting the fans know I was a part of it. And now I'm building a brand off the reputation I made freelancing. I'm applying the lessons I learned there and uh, using the contacts I made there. But one, sure. one, one caution I do really want to put out there when you're going back and forth. Okay? If there is one rule in this industry, if you don't own it, it will be taken away from you. And in all likelihood, somebody will do something with it that you don't like. So be very, 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 very careful what you're saving for yourself. If you have if you have, you know, gauge the level of emotional attachment you have to it. And if it's something you're too much in love with, you may want to keep that for yourself. That's a hard, hard lesson I've had to learn. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's looking at owner controlled and work for hire. Sure. If you're working freelance for most companies, your contract will be work for hire. You do not own what you have done once you've signed it over to them once you've been paid that's it it's no longer your concern they can do with it what they want the vast majority of stuff i've written in my career i have no say over now because it it was all work for hire my own stuff that i still do control obviously i do have say over and you know chris is right if it's something that is very personal to you that you want to maintain control over don't do it work for hire (laughs) keep control of it um you know but there are lots of avenues we are in kind of like a golden age in terms of self-publishing i mean you know back in the late 80s early 90s and before that it was a case of you spent far too much money getting a print run that was far too large that would sit in your garage for the rest of eternity (laughs) uh that you you humped around to various conventions to try and sell desperately (laughs) from your thing whereas now we have online things we have drive-through we have you know ipr we have print on demand, Lulu, you name it, all these things that give people a chance to self-publish that, you know, we didn't have 30 years ago. The Um, barriers to entry have never been lower, right? Yeah. yeah. 
Um, but again, that goes back to that actually in some ways makes it easy, but also makes it harder because you've got to get your signal out over that noise. Right. And that, that is really tricky and something, mm. I mean, you know, I don't have a huge amount of experience with because most of my career has been freelancing. Mm. Um, and I mean, in a lot of ways, this is a terribly small and incestuous industry. So, you know, <laughs> it's, there's not that many people in it. Uh, and right. everybody tends to know, you know, it's kind of like a six degrees of Kevin Bacon of the gaming industry. <laughs> you you are not very far removed from everybody else in it at the end of the day. Um, so, you know, word gets round about good writers, trusted pairs of hands, people who will work well in teams. Um, but on sort of like the indie publishing, self-publishing side of things, I am really not the person to talk to about that I don't really <laughs> do much of it. <laughs> Huh. Okie doke. Uh, uh, Alex, did you have anything else uh, uh, to put on this, or do we want to switch to? Um, uh... I would say I've made my brand known by running adventures at every convention I can get my butt to. Um, right. Sure. The world. <laughs> um, to the extent that, you know, news spreads word of mouth. Um, you know, people say to each other, hey, this is really cool. You should play it. Um, and that's kind of old school. Do you self-publish as well? I don't, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I can't whether you would work would primarily like freelance to. or do you. I would like to, um, but I have the business sense of a, of a snail. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, I think I have a very uh, sellable product. Um, I'm just not business adept. Sure. So maybe someday I'll find someone to collaborate with who can do that kind of stuff. <laughs> but, uh, um, I, I focus on making my money on the day job where I'm a writer for video games. Ah, okay. Yeah, and the other thing to add is that it is okay not to be business oriented. That sure. might not be what you're doing this for. <laughs> but thankfully, Absolutely. again, with things like um, sort of like Jonestown Compendium, um, Miskatonic Repository, um, I can never remember the exact name of the D&D version, but there are ways that you can get your thing out there where you don't have to worry too much about the business side of things because not everybody is a business person. Don't, I think, don't yeah, make yourself the miserable problem, trying to be. <laughs> yeah, I think part of the problem now is that everyone is expected to be their own entrepreneur and run their own Kickstarters and, you know, find their own publishers. and. Yeah, not everybody is actually. Good there's at that. there's absolutely a, a prized DIY ethic uh, yeah. within RPGs, uh, and you know, kind of like the the farther the the more indie that you're talking about for that, the more that's actually, uh, I think, kind of a, a, a privileged uh, as as a position, right? Is that uh, you know, everybody is very impressed by the person who can handle all of the parts of their business single handedly, right? And it's a it's a terrible burden to put on some people who are not uh you know who who have a lot to offer potentially but are not themselves uh in a situation where they can be uh you know handling their own distribution handling their own marketing doing the art for their own covers and that kind of thing right there's a there's a there's there's a lot that goes into making a product um and i'm always one to be trying to you know encourage people to make partnerships uh and 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 work together in you know in small groups and find out you know there's somebody out there who is good at the thing that you don't know how to do. And, you know, you should, your, your best, uh, your best bet is probably to find that person and work with them. So. Yeah. I'll say, um, I am autistic, so I struggle a lot with, um, managing things like finances and, um, admin and businessy stuff. Marketing terrifies me. <laughs> As I've done a few, well, I'm a really, really, really good game designer. And it's sure. okay to be a really it's good okay game to be that, designer. right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, but I am not a business person at all in any way, shape, or form. I, I spent twelve years running two reasonably large-sized companies within uh, within the game industry, at least for it, and I hated every minute of that part of it. <laughs> right? I mean, I'm glad I did it. I learned an enormous <laughs> amount. I'm proud of the things that I made by every question. But I, the the, the burden that came off my shoulders the day that I said, you know what, I'm just freelancing again, uh, mm -hmm. was enormous. Right? It's I, I completely 
completely. And, and since then, I have self-published two or three small, uh, uh, you know, pieces just because I couldn't find another place to put them, right? But wherever I could, I have always worked with other people, with companies um, that were willing to take on that part of it because I've I've done all the, you know, I've done all the presidenting of a company I ever intend to do. <laughs> intend to do, right? I'm I'm done with that part. So, yeah. I think, I think my it's... problem is that again with the autism, I am terrible at networking. So I'm very much. I just sit. Mm. I do my own thing. <laughs> I go and and, and well, you're here at Metatopia. You've taken an enormous step there. there. <laughs> you're at the right con to make this happen, right? To, you know, for, yeah. so uh, you know, so so you've 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 taken the right step there at least for it to you know, this is a community that's very good for that sort of thing. So. Should we take some questions? Uh, I was going to say, uh, Mickey, do you want to see if there's any uh, questions in the in the stream there that we absolutely need to handle? Well, okay, so there re there's really only one outstanding question, and I think that you've just been addressing it. It's okay. It's basically a question about how to stand out uh, because the the barrier to entry is so low. How do you stand out on platforms like itch.io and things like that when you're putting your product out as a self-published person? Um, yeah, I think that we have been. It's the, the question is how to stand out on platforms like Itch.io uh, or DriveThru. And I think we've kind of like hit most of the ways that we would have as advice, right? Like one, build your brand so that people are actually coming to look specifically for your name uh, or for, you know, like the kind of thing that you've established that you can do. Um, have fabulous art to the best of your ability, right? Work with great artists if you're not one uh, and make sure that your 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 product is eye catching when people are, you know, kind of like scanning through the, you know, the racks in your store or the, you know, the, the pages online as you're skimming through drive through or something like that. Um, what else? What do, do we have? Do we have other kind of like quick suggestions of like, how do we make yeah. ourselves stand out? Find the social media that works for you. Like I can't do Twitter because sure. I'm a crier, but uh, Facebook works great for me because I'm a reasonably good word guy. And you wait, know, go I back. Got, yeah, I'm a, crier, I'm a crier. I can't handle Twitter. Oh, you're uh, you know, you're a, crier, a crier, so you can't handle Twitter. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I. I. I I'm wait burst into tears way too easily to ever handle Twitter, but Facebook, I'm a reasonably good word guy. So Facebook, I can just I can type at length about what I'm doing, and that's and that's how I I'm reaching people. People are meaner to you on Twitter than Facebook. People are way Twitter, meaner to Twitter, me on Facebook than Twitter. Twitter, Twitter is a sewer of cruelty and ignorance. I could, I know, wow. no, 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 I could, okay. no, no, no. Except for you, you're awesome on Twitter. Well, well, thank you, dear. <laughs> so there is something I think about um, about networking. So I mean, uh, if you get to the stage where you're kind of going, I have this product, I'm going to put on something. Um, how do I get that to stand out? I mean, that's an important question, but it's also too late to be asking the question. Um, sure. There is some, I mean, especially in indie publishing, a, a lot of what happens is, you know, you, you attend conventions, you um, you build good working relationships with people, you play test other people's games, things like that. And, and actually those are your, your first kind of, um, your first kind of buyers. So I, I think I just emphasize that there, that actually, you know, the networking side is kind of where you start building your audience. Right. Within the communities that you're... Sorry, yes. I think it goes more fundamental than that. Um, I think the way to stand out is to be unique, have something that's different to what everyone else sure. is doing. Um, I certainly think that's the big strength of, of the stuff that I do. Um, I've never seen anyone else uh, doing the sort of stuff I do, although other than a few people who have played in my ventures and have tried to mimic <laughs> the style with mixed success, but sure. still imitation is the greatest form of flattery. And I was quite flattered. Sure. Um, but yeah, be, well, be unique. I, I think that's the same kind of idea, right? I mean, they won't know you're unique unless that you've shown it, right? So, I mean, the mm -hmm. fact that you have run this unique, fascinating adventure at, at a con is in fact, you're actually doing marketing for yourself, right? Like to a certain extent, that's part of the marketing job. So. And, and we should never forget how, as, as we were saying, how small this industry is. If you're doing something unique and good, people will know about it people much faster than I think right. most of us realize. Right. And of, of this whole sorry mess that this entire year has been with the, com with the, the, you know, the pandemic, the one shining thing that has come out of it is the fact that 
because we're doing online conventions, people's chances to run games for people to, to audiences they would not normally be mm -hmm. able to reach has just gone. It's exploded. I mean, there are conventions that I would never have been able to attend that I've given panels at, I've run games at. So, you know, there's people who've never gamed with me, never heard me speak, you know, bless them. They've had to put up with that. Uh, but they've also got to listen to some really cool and interesting people as well that they wouldn't right. normally necessarily have got to. Um, so, you know, physical conventions are great, but not everybody can access them. And I would hope to see going forward that we maintain at least some kind of level like this that, you know, people can take part online worldwide. Right. So that you are getting exposure to new and interesting people that you may not otherwise have heard of if you were only going to physical conventions. Right. Absolutely. And I, as as somebody who's uh, you know involved in the management of this one, I can tell you we're never going back. Right. I mean, yes, we will once again do Metatopia in person, but there will always be this component to it. I think going forward, I think you know this is a uh, we've learned so much in in running this convention online this year for it. That's we're not we're not going to just toss those skills aside and the the opportunities that we've seen uh, for this show. So I think there will always be this part of Metatopia is. It's a permanent feature going forward. So, it, it um, I'm signed up um, for various online adventures, in which I am running my stuff uh, to, you know, majority Americans and people outside of Europe and outside of the UK. And I am so thrilled and excited to be introducing my stuff to an audience right. absolutely um, who otherwise struggle to reach. That's fabulous! Awesome. It's yes. Uh, it's uh, we're getting to time to wrap this up. So if everybody wants to take uh, one or two more minutes here to uh, you know anything final that you want to say on the topic, but also to remind us who you are and where we can find you, uh, so that we can support your stuff uh, going forward. And once again, I'm going to start over with Alex here for this. Of uh, you know where can we find you online? Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm not on Twitter because Twitter is terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> if we Established one thing in this in this panel. It's that Twitter is terrifying. It's that yeah. Twitter is terrible. <laughs> yes, right. Okay. Um, I should have a website, but I haven't got one. Um, I'm, and uh, yeah, generally I'm findable at like major conventions. Okay. Europe, what's the next? Actually, what's the next one you're doing? Um, the next couple of things are sort of. Uh, LARP and freeform conventions. There's one called Virtual Bubble in a few weeks. Um, there's Virtual Consequences about a week after that. Uh, there is ExtraCon, which is Intercon online. Oh, right. Yep. Um, and yeah, I am running stuff at all of these. Fabulous. All right. Uh, Chris, where do we find you online? Uh, one final tip: Hawaiian shirts for your company. Uh, you can find me. Uh, you can find me on uh, on Facebook. Just Google uh, or go to Facebook. Look up Go Show Press, and you can find out what we're up to. Uh, if you're a creator with an idea, I'd love to talk to you. And uh, we have a big announcement for our big January Kickstarter coming in the next in the next week or so. So uh, so please come check that out. All righty, Lynn. Um, you will find me on Twitter, <laughs> which, <laughs> right, granted, you know, certain areas of it are a cesspool, but some of it is really <laughs> lovely. Uh, at Cogs and Cakes, um, and I'm usually on there wittering about what I get up to <laughs> during the day, um, talking about cups of tea and various other, you know, inanities. Um, if you really want to listen to that, um, obviously, I, I am slaving away under the great tentacled one's whip. So, uh, you know, keep an eye out on Chaosium because there will be something here, there and everywhere. Uh, and I'm, I'm just generally lurking around in the shadows most of the time, actually. Graham? Um, so uh, you can find myself on Drive Through RPG, especially my my sort of weird experimental stuff. Um, my best known product is probably Cthulhu Dark, and you can get that from Indie Press Revolution. Excellent. 
Uh, as for me, if you uh, are interested in talking to me about actual work for this, you can get me on Facebook or on Twitter uh, at, uh, at DarrenWatts27. Um, if you're interested in talking to me about the convention side of this, you can reach me at Darren at Dexposure.com. Uh, uh, and uh, if you want to uh, see other things that I'm doing besides this, uh, you can check out my podcast uh, called Explain This Comics Guys, uh, which can be found primarily at explainthis.podbean.com. I think we're good, guys. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks for coming, all of you, for this. Uh, and I believe that uh, we are actually bringing the curtain on Metatopia right now as we're doing this. We are, in fact, the last panel. Uh, so thank true. you all to everybody for uh, you know coming for the show. Yeah, thanks, thanks everybody for, for a great con. Mm -hmm.